You're listening to Seminary Dropout, episode five. My guest today is managing editor of Christianity Today magazine and co-founder of Hermeneutics, the Christianity Today site for women. Uh, Caitlin Beatty, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Shane. Well, I want to start out by asking about Hermeneutics, and you are you were actually uh, the founder, one of the founders. What was the impetus behind that? Well, in 2009, uh, Christianity Today was seeking to expand its online presence, and at the time, there was just one other um, editor who was a woman on staff, and as we were brainstorming about, um, you know, could we launch a blog, we came up with the idea of doing a women's blog, and the impetus was partially, you know, practical, wanting to attract a new audience to the site, but also just acknowledging that um, the voices of Christian women aren't as highly represented in Christianity Today's history. Mm. And um, we, we thought it was important to cover the news of the day and offer cultural analysis um, from the perspective of people who haven't always shaped the conversations at the highest levels of uh, church leadership or Christian leadership. So, it was a way to highlight women's voices and just acknowledging that women, um, you know, are going to come to issues from a slightly different perspective and one that's very valuable. And so was there, was there nothing specifically for women on Christianity Today before hermeneutics? There wasn't anything associated with Christianity Today magazine. Um, we have, we're part of a larger company based here in the Chicago suburbs. And we do have a couple other sites within the company that are that are for women, but um, we really we felt like we needed to retain kind of the CT ethos. So, you know, coming covering news and not necessarily just devotional material was really important. A lot of the content for Christian women is is you know it's good, but it's more devotional, more personal, and introspective. And with hermeneutics, we wanted to signal that you know, Christian women care about what's going on in the world. Um, they want to think deeply about the issues of the day, and we don't need to, you know, make it light for women, basically. Right, right, yeah. So, and hermeneutics is growing, and it's it's obviously resonating with women and with men as well. What do you think it is about that that's right. connecting with people? Right. Well, I think you know, as I said, that hermeneutics is filling a niche that really hasn't been filled in quite quite the same way or such a consistent way. Um, so, I think it's showing that women, at least in this in this time and era, um, are highly educated. They are informed about the issues of the day. Many of them are wives and mothers, um, but they don't necessarily claim those labels as their only source of identity. They have their own pursuits, um, whether in, in ministry or in the corporate world. Um, and so I think hermeneutics is speaking to their level. And I think that will be increasingly important in church conversations that the, any kind of ministry or outreach for women is at a is at an intelligent and thoughtful level and doesn't assume that, you know, every woman wants a manicure at church. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with manicures, but, you know, Christian discipleship and cultural analysis from a Christian perspective needs to go a bit deeper. Cool. How do you feel like, so in addition to, to your role at hermeneutics, uh, you're also the managing editor at Christianity today. What, um, how do you feel like your leadership at hermeneutics informed your work at, at Christianity today? Yeah. Well, so I just took on this position, you know, 
about not even two months ago. And so I am, I'm still acclimating and adjusting to the new responsibilities. But I think increasingly, um, because of the relative success of hermeneutics and because we see that we're tapping into some kind of need or some kind of interest um, among Christians, um, that what works on hermeneutics will work in the print magazine. And so the perspective of Christian women isn't just rele- will just be relegated to this women's blog or women's site, but will be more fully incorporated into the print magazine. Um, and that, that's something that I hope to do. I know that's something that the other editors here hope to do, just to signal this magazine isn't just for men. It's for women, too, and women can open up any issue of the magazine and see something that resonates with them that reflects their own experience um, and that, you know, just, just connects with where they are um, in, their, in their engagement. So I think we'll see more incorporation of, of the ethos of hermeneutics into the print magazine. How long have you had that role there as, as managing editor? I took on the role on October 22nd of this year, so not quite two months. Okay. And yeah, so it's <laughs> um, it's a you know it's a challenging time to be in print print uh, journalism, especially for a Christian nonprofit. Um, so we're we're talking a lot about how to expand our content uh, digitally. You know, we have an iPad edition, we have an iPhone app, so we've we've done a series of eBooks. Um, so we're trying to crack this code that pretty much every other publication, including the New York Times, is trying to crack, which is right. how do you, you know, how do you, um, how do you build a financially stable uh, business model when you've offered content for free for years and years, and you know people are just used to getting all of their content online for free? How do you suddenly start charging for that, and how do you create an incentive for that? So that's that's one of the many challenges we're facing, but it's also a really exciting time, I think, to be at Christianity Today. Um, the magazine is almost 60 years old, and it was founded by Billy Graham um, kind of as a, as a um, central place for uh, leaders in the evangelical movement at the time, and would take a, a moderate and measured tone, and I think we've, um, we've maintained that tone through the years. And so now we just need to figure out how to make it, <laughs> how to you know, charge people for it, basically. Right, right. <laughs> or how to make it more more financially viable. Well, you bring up a, a few interesting things there. And one that, that I've wondered about is in, you know, you talked about uh, the New York Times and, and you know, they're, they're going through obviously the same difficulty. I want to talk a little bit about the journalism in in secular in the secular world and secular news, and then and then with journalism inside the world of of evangelicalism. Um, what's what's that like? Have you ever have you ever done journalism in in outside of the the Christian spectrum? I haven't. I I came to Christianity today pretty much right out of um, undergraduate at Calvin College in in West Michigan, and so I never I haven't had the experience of you know working in a in a newsroom that's not affiliated with faith. Um, I I do think that for a while now there's been the sentiment that religion, especially you know conservative Christianity, is kind of this oddball. Thing. Right, <laughs> and certainly, um, you know, the the statements of certain leaders in the country who have presumed to speak for the entire American church have have helped to just bolster that that image of the oddball, you know, even farther. Um, but I think in the past ten years, there's, you know, I was talking to another uh, journalist over the weekend, and she was noting that you know for a while. It, it was like whenever the New York Times would cover something about conservative Christians, the tone was kind of, for example, there there's kind of a recurring theme in a lot of secular media of 
wow, Christians care about justice issues too. We thought they only cared about abortion and homosexuality. Right. And at Christianity Today, we're thinking, well, we've known that for a while. You know, it's, it, you know, the, the concern for the poor and to seek justice for the oppressed is a, is a continuing theme throughout church history, including in the evangelical movement. Um, so it's, sometimes it's kind of funny <laughs> to see secular media, media try to capture the spirit of this, this um, branch of the church that we're obviously very familiar with. Um, but I think you're seeing a better understanding, a better grasp of what, what uh, Christianity is and different segments of it, and that it's not purely a political movement in the United States. Um, right. Just in terms of, you know, working at a secular newsroom, I think I would, you know, of course, love that experience um, to just be part of a stellar news team. But I, I also feel like at Christianity Today, the editors here have a great understanding that we are we're we're offering a, a much needed service to the church, and right. that um, you know, we we taught we use the image of. Um, holding a mirror up to the church. So we're very committed to telling the truth um, about about the church, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that's not meaning that we we relish the bad news, but you know, we're not affiliated with any denomination. We're not affiliated with any um, other kind of nonprofit that, that's funding us. And so we have the independence and the integrity to speak truthfully about the church. And I think the role of truth telling can be a source of great reform in the church, um, a, gr a source of great, you know, self-reflection and uh, discernment and reform in, in many segments of the church. So I, I, I value that role that I get to be a part of. Well, you raised a, a great question and, you know, Christianity today is kind of a, um, it, it kind of has a big tent philosophy, I guess, uh, that, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. the, the spectrum of Christianity is so, is so long when you, you know, from, from conservative to liberal, but also denominations. And right. I'm, I'm really curious as to how Christianity today navigates those waters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's it's something that, you know, in a way, if we were tied to a denomination, our job would be a little easier in that we would have clear a clear sense of what the boundaries are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> but you know, we've we've used historically, CT has used the language of the evangelical movement, and this was you know post-war conservative Christianity. Billy Graham was a major have played a major role in that in that movement, um, kind of a neo orthodoxy. And um, I don't, we don't, we're not sure if movement is quite quite the right word because, as you noted, the spectrum is very long. And um, a leader on the right and a leader on the left wouldn't really consider themselves um, allies. They would look at each other and think, "You're you're the problem with." church, basically. Right. Um, so it's, at CT, we have both the privilege and the challenge of figuring out how to include um, both of those voices. Now, a couple guidelines would be, you know, a basic Orthodox Christian faith. Do you read the, read the scriptures as a, the authoritative word of God? Do you regularly attend church? Um, could you sign off on the creeds without a problem? Um, we do have certain, you know, historical and scriptural boundaries, but you also just have the question of how do you interpret the scriptures? I mean, you could, it's one thing to say, I believe that the scriptures are the authoritative word of God, but how you apply the scriptures to contemporary life and contemporary ethical issues, there's going to be a spectrum of that. Um, but I think we try to practice a, a generous orthodoxy, and so you might have Someone like, I'm trying to think, you have someone, we've had, you know, Brian McLaren in our pages, which 
a lot of people would, would kind of balk at that, but we've also had, you know, John Piper and Mark Driscoll in our pages too. Right. And how can it be the case that both, you know, these, these three people could all be in the same pages, but I think the church benefits when we're able to include those voices charitably and ultimately let our readers discern for themselves what, what the best way is forward. And I think too that it it takes a respected publication like Christianity Today that that was founded by Billy Graham that <clears throat> that can pull off something like that because I know and we have kind of in the church have a problem with uh, anti intellectualism I think and mm-hmm. if we you know if I'm uh, on the conservative side and I see that. Uh, you know, someone has Brian McLaren, and we have this tendency to write them off, and uh, right. and, and and vice versa. You know, the left, you have Mark Driscoll yeah. on, well, you know, and and to get labeled. But I think that uh, Christianity Today seems to have kind of transcended that. And mm. there's, if anyone can have that voice of, hey, you might agree, you might disagree, but we need to consider both sides of this. And I think that Christianity right. Today has done a really good job of that. Yeah, that's really good to hear. Well, I I, uh, I gather from from when you graduated undergrad that you were fairly young. Was it uh, somewhat intimidating coming to Christianity Today as such an established place at, at, a, at such a younger age when um, maybe those around you had, had more experience and things like that? Or or what, what was that experience like? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was intimidating for the first couple years of being an editor here. I I wasn't sure what my place was or what my role was. Um I, I graduated from Calvin in 2006 and uh, did a semester study abroad in England. And then when I came back to the States, um, got got an administrative job at Christianity Today, did that for six months, not even thinking that I would be on the magazine staff. And then I get this call from our editor, Mark Galley, asking me to, to consider applying for a copy editor position which is kind of like low man on the totem pole. But I was just sure. so I was just so excited to, that he even I don't even know how he got my name to be honest. Wow. Um, so, you know, I did the copy editing thing for a couple of years and that that's basically just reading all copy and making sure that everything's correct. And so, but I think also I I don't know. I I think I started just absorbing a lot of information from the other editors around me. I mean, most of the editors here have been been with CT for at least fifteen or twenty years. Um, some of them, I didn't study journalism in college, and so I worked on the student newspaper, but I don't have a degree in journalism, and so they their their breadth of knowledge, um, both about journalism and about the the church are just fast and I felt like I kind of absorbed it <laughs> absorbed that knowledge by osmosis for the first couple of years. I think I noticed a shift when hermeneutics started and this other editor and I really had some um, some influ- uh, just more influence over the tone of our of our online presence and we're able to make, editorial decisions on our own and that that gave me a sense of ownership and a and a sense of what my role is here and my my sense of that has just grown over the past few years and and so what's your how are you um uh, I guess what I want to ask is what's your role with hermeneutics now do you do you write many articles now or are you more in a supervisory role so right now I I'm basically the the point editor for the website and so any of the content that appears on the site I've worked with the author to to shape and have edited it and found a title and an image and use social media to promote it so I'm I'm responsible for all the content I unfortunately I don't get as much time as I would like to actually write a lot of articles I'll write an occasional piece 
you know, when something like just really lights a fire in my belly. But um, for the most part, I'm more in a supervisory managing editor role for the website. And, and we're actually, that, that will change pretty soon because we are hiring um, a full-time editor to take over hermeneutics and we're, we're in that, that uh, seeking process right now. And so um, I will still have some kind of oversight, but I won't be doing as much of the day-to-day work with hermeneutics. But it's, it's hard to think about <laughs> stepping back from it because in some ways it feels like you know, a baby. Yeah, that, 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 yeah, that's <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking. It's got to feel like like it's your baby. And we mentioned earlier that that the that the audience for hermeneutics is growing, and that, uh, mm-hmm. that it, it, not only are women reading, but men are as well. It, do you? Right. I'm just curious. Do you have um, do you have analytics on that? Um, like what the the ratio to women to men is. You know, we don't we don't have analytics on gender. I don't think that I don't know. The, how, I don't even know how you would track that. <laughs> yeah, but we can you know we can do an a guesstimate just based on reader comments and right and comments anecdotal. That I get personally from from readers who are men saying you know I really liked this post or I really I visit the site every week or whatever it is so. I'm assuming, you know, it's, I would guess it's probably 80, 20, 70, 30. You know, I think it's still majority women, but it's really encouraging to see that men can come to the site and find content that interests them. And, you know, sometimes the the topics are a little more (laughs) gender specific, Um, but just that, the, the quality of the writing itself is what is what attracts people. Yeah, and I, you know, and I, I am I count myself among those men who read hermeneutics, and I think that oh, I, I found exactly what you said to be true that the articles are they're well written and they are also they're things that. Um, <sighs> Although the, the maybe the primary audience is women, it's not that it doesn't pertain to to men as well. And there is there is depth, and there's also real news there. It's not like you said; it's not about um, you know having pedicures at church or stuff like that. But it's real right. issues that that really affect us us all. So yeah. I want to I want to move on to to talk about this is our city, which is uh, kind of another uh, project of Christianity today. To, Talk a little bit about what This Is Our City is and what your role is there. Yeah. So This Is Our City is an article and documentary film series that we launched last year in 2011. And it's a series about how Christians throughout the United States are contributing to the common good of their cities. So the phrase that... that um, the, the team that I work with and I have created and that we use a lot is comprehensive flourishing. What does it look like for Christians to seek, um, seek the betterment of their community, um, often outside the walls of the church? So we talk a lot about um, Christians who are wielding their vocation or their vo- vocational skills, um, you know, in education and media and business in the arts to bring transformation and healing to the specific place where they, where they are planted. So through the series, we are highlighting six different uh, major U S cities. We just finished a lot of our reporting in Detroit, Michigan. Um, We've spent time in Portland, Oregon, um, Richmond, Virginia, Phoenix, we're starting to do research in Silicon Valley, and we'll finish with New York City. And that will be through 2013. So we're a little over halfway through the project. Um, and in each of those cities, we've found a different theme or a different question that, that we've explored. Um, but we also have a feature on our website called The Seventh City. And The Seventh City is basically... Um, wherever our readers are, stories that are emerging from their own communities. Um, so we featured a lot of 
you know, we just had a piece last week from Toronto. Um, we've had a couple articles from outside the United States. Um, so I think the impetus of the project is to highlight what Christians are, are known for in their communities rather than being known for what they're against. And just looking at really practical and sacrificial ways that Christians are serving their neighbors, you know, whether or, or not their neighbors proclaim Christ. Um, so we, we've we gotten very positive feedback about the project, just that um, it's encouraging, it's it's uh it's kind of a good news series, you know. Right. And um and also that it is shaping how our readers are thinking about what they could do in their own communities. That there's a certain um there's a certain implicit call, I think, in a lot of the stories to think, well what could I do on this issue in my city? You know, is is this an issue in my city? How could I you know, contribute to the common good. Um, so um, it was kind of started by Andy Crouch, who's the author of Culture Making, and he actually is now, as of December 1st, he is an editor, executive editor at Christianity Today. So he and I are working pretty closely both on the, the City Project and the print magazine. Um, but we, yeah, we're about... A little over halfway done, there are features in the print magazine every few issues, and we have um, kind of launch parties in each of the cities when we're done with the reporting there, just w- a way to gather the Christians Christians in the city and basically celebrate the good work that they're doing and encourage them to connect with each other and keep on doing that good work. So it's a, it's a very fun and... In, you know, personally encouraging project to be a part of. Yeah, I bet. What are, do you have any stories from uh, the project that stick out to you? Um, let's see. Well, <laughs> off the top of my head, um, we, we met a woman in Richmond, Virginia, who um, at, in her 50s, found out that she had breast cancer and had, you know, just series and series of treatments and in and out of the hospital. And she, um, in, in the middle of her, her illness and, uh, battling cancer, she decided to create and patent this garment that other women who are battling breast cancer could take to the hospital. And it, it sounds kind of like, Oh, that's nice. <laughs> but what was really cool about the story is to see someone who is suffering, and yet somehow that suffering propels her to create something out of her suffering and create something that will benefit other people. Um, yeah, and it was probably really meaningful to those people who are benefiting from it. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um we spent a lot of time on the issue of sex trafficking in Portland and just being able to, um, you know, connect with the people who, the Christians there who are basically giving their lives to this, to fighting this. Um, we, we met a, a man who is the, the director of a very small nonprofit in Portland that is working to create laws and legislation um, that may just basically make it harder to traffic children. And so this man ha- was mar- is married and has a young child and was going to the, the state courthouse, you know, several times a week in meetings with these legislators and trying to lobby. And you just saw how, what a sacrifice and, people give to to change to be able to change how things currently are and um and also just the personal toll that it took for him emotionally and psychologically i think especially on the issue of sex trafficking we have this image of christians like 
you know, going to India and breaking down the door of a brothel and saving girls who are being trafficked. And that, that kind of work happens, and that's really great. But sometimes it takes years and years and years to bring change. And, um, and it's a very, just because of the nature of the, the problem, it's very hard to, to work on for years and years and feel like the change is very incremental. Um, but we thought it was really important to show that kind of story. So it is a success story, but it's a success story over years and years and not, you know, a one-time rescue that changes, that solves the problem, basically. Right. And I, I'm glad you brought up the article because I wanted to talk about it. Um, so, you know, when I first uh, kind of browsed the This Is Our City website, and, you know, I kind of got the idea, okay, this is about, you know, Christians doing good things in, in the cities. And, and I understand you wanted to get, you know, diversity between the cities, and that's how you pick them. I'm a little upset you picked Portland and not Austin, but we'll, we'll go with it. That's okay. Um, I'm sure Austin is cooler than Portland. I'm sure it has, you know, more local coffee shops than Portland does. <laughs> I don't know. I've been to both because people in Austin are required to visit Portland, but... Uh, yeah, I don't know. It may be a tie. Um, it, but I wanted to talk about that article because it, it number one, it, the content was excellent, but it also gave me a better understanding about what the This Is Our City project was about because mm-hmm. it's a beautiful story about Shoshan. Is that how you say his name? Mm-hmm. Shoshone, yeah. Shoshone, okay. And I'm guessing that's the one you were talking about who – he moves mm-hmm. moves to Portland and realizes that there is this uh, huge sex trafficking trafficking industry, and right. uh, so so he forms this uh, nonprofit and they do some great things. Um, they you know they get a grant from the government. Um, they actually help change some laws um, that for and the, this kind of blew my mind. But they they helped uh, three bills pass in the Oregon legislature. And one was, uh, increase the fines for purchasing sex from a minor from 800 to $10,000. Um, I can't, I can't believe that's not time in prison, but, but going from 800 to $10,000 is a big deal. You know, take, you take this small victories. Uh, and, and then other things like, like shifting the thinking from treating, um, the the person who's who's caught up in the prostitution who's being trafficked instead of treating them like uh like a perpetrator treating them like the victim that they are um right and, and the perception yeah. and, and so he's busy with that and then the story he keeps um that you know they uh hook up with with social workers who are you know one is a believer and then uh they work with the uh with the police sergeant in charge of sex trafficking in Portland, who, who is a believer. Uh, and then they work with legislature, uh, the way they work with a congressman who is a believer to get laws passed. And right. it's this, it's this beautiful story where no one person does everything, but right. through, you know, everyone doing their little part they get these huge things changed they they bring about justice in their city and and it was just a beautiful article and so you you did a really good job with that one. Oh, thank you yeah i think i think this when i what i found in portland reporting this story is that as you said you know no one person or one group can can bring a lasting change, but it requires um, Christians willing to partner with each other and willing to partner with non-Christians as well, um, and not, you know, coming in and pretending we have the we have all the answers, but right. willing to um, let other people with expertise um, step in and and I think that's a model that can be applied to a lot of you know, problems that cities are facing. It's not going to be one person or one group that makes the change, but it's going to be Christians, you know, with the humility to partner with one another that will, that will make lasting change. 
Yeah. And, and you, there's another article that you wrote for the project that was, uh, in some ways it was, you know, the article itself was shorter, the story was shorter and it was a little more simple, but no less beautiful yeah. about, uh, this, uh, owner of a, a Chick-fil-A who notices the, the refugee population and says, you know, Hey, I can, I can hire refugees. And he, um, you know, he employs them and he gives them hope. And, you know, some of these people had, uh, you know, fairly prestigious jobs in their homeland, but they come here and their their skills mm-hmm. that they can't that they can't use. And so, um, right. but it was just this simple, seemingly simple act uh, on the part mm-hmm. of this man that makes a huge difference in people's lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a fun story to write. As you said, it's pretty. It's a little more straightforward <laughs> than than the sex trafficking piece. Um, just because of the nature of, of the work. But um, you see this business owner who has exposure to the refugee population in Richmond um, due to a Christian leadership institute that he was a part of. And so he just was exposed to people in his community who were having trouble making ends meet, having a hard time um, finding, a, finding gainful employment where – they could speak the language, and this this story came out around the time that Chick Fil A was in the news a lot earlier this year, and right. and it was it was kind of a way to say, um, you know, there are, there are different Christian models for thinking about how to change a culture, yeah. and one would be kind of um, more we are known by kind of the, the businesses that we support, and there, there's probably, you know, a place for that, but here you have this, this business owner who has a certain amount of, of power to wield in his community, and you see him using it to, um, to reach out to, um, to people who need gainful employment and building relationships with them. I think the story just did so well on our site because, because of the timing and because it was a another w- Christian witness in the public square to what it means to be a Christian in the public square. It, so. Yeah. And, and you hit it, there's timeliness of it. Cause right when that came out was when the, the huge controversy uh, over, you know, the CEO of Chick-fil-A's comments about gay marriage. And, and it was at a time when the world, frankly, didn't need another article about that controversy. And so right. yeah. it, it was the perfect time to publish that article because it said, it, you know, it had to do with Chick-fil-A. And it also, it, it was Christians working in the world that was, a, that was not in the culture wars, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think that yeah, I was—I kind of alluded to this earlier when we were talking about secular media. Um, I think the culture war narrative is kind of neat and tidy in a way for a lot of major media, and it kind—it's of, a narrative that's well worn and it makes sense. Yeah, and certainly Christians are, you know, doing things that fit that narrative very well. Um, but I think it was running this piece when we did was an intentional way of saying that's not the only story out there about right. Christians and Chick-fil-A. There's this other story that isn't being told that needs to be told. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that Christianity yeah. today as a whole does a good job of that, of telling the other side of that story. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so too. That's why I enjoy working here. So much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Caitlin, Anything else that you want to leave with us today? I I don't think so. Just that I'm I'm really excited to see um, what happens with Christianity today in the coming years with hermeneutics, and I'm just honored to be um, to have this kind of um, influence and service for for the church. And I hope that your listeners will come to our website and find something that they enjoy and that edifies and encourages them. So give us, so give us the, the website, obviously Christianitytoday.com 
and then yeah. is uh, hermeneutics can uh, do they just link there from Christianity Today, or is there uh, can they get there by going to to spe- straight to hermeneutics? So yeah, you can you can get to hermeneutics from our main site, which is as you said, ChristianityToday.com. Um, hermeneutics, if you want to go there, you know, independently is blog.christianitytoday.com slash women. So it's a little longer. And then um, the city project is just this is our city.org. Okay, cool, cool. And if they want to follow you on Twitter? My handle is Caitlin Beatty, K A T E L Y N B E A T Y. Cool, easy enough. Well, yeah. K- Caitlin, thanks so much for being on the show today. Thanks so much for having me, Shane. All right. Take care. All right. You too. Bye-bye. So there it is, folks, my interview with Caitlin Beatty. I hope you enjoyed it. Listen, go check out Hermeneutics. Go check out This Is Our City Project. You you won't be disappointed. The writing's great. The stories are, are really good, and um, I, I know that you're going to like it. So check that out. I want to remind you that uh, my blog is is up and that I post every week when I don't post a podcast. So I either post a podcast on Monday or I, I post a blog post on Monday. So uh, go check that out. Uh, last week I posted on, on gun control and the role of the Christ follower there. Um, obviously in the wake of the tragedy in Connecticut and uh, what we could do to prevent that. So go, and I would love to hear your feedback there in the comments section. And also want to remind you that you can always leave a comment on the podcast as well. So if I have an interview with someone and you think that you want to ask them something or pose a question based on the podcast, go to that post in the blog and leave a comment. And, And I would bet more times than not that the person that I interviewed would be glad to engage you there in the comment section and reply back. And I almost always reply, uh, to the comments in the blog. So uh, I would love for you to do that. Go to the comments section. Remember, you can get there by going to seminarydropout.com. And uh, also, if you're interested in uh, having me come speak at your event, uh, you can go to the comments section of my blog and reach me there. I want to give a special thanks to those of you who have given a five-star review or review at all at uh, on iTunes and for those who have left a rating and left a review I want to really thank you I'm looking right now and Jer er, 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 me who these are screen names of course uh, who I think is Jeremy Glover thank you Jeremy for leaving a review Brooker H who I think is Brooke Holloway thank you Brooke Tristan Summers appreciate it buddy uh, E-C-I-M-O-G all caps thank you so much for leaving that review and uh, it, it helps. It helps, uh, you know, Seminary Dropout to uh, go up in the rankings so that more people see it, more people discover it. So I would greatly appreciate it if you uh, thought that this was a great podcast, if you liked it. I'd appreciate you going on iTunes and saying so and giving a review and rating. Uh, last, uh, I want to say that this is the last podcast of the year. It's only been going about a month, so... I am just so thankful for all of you who have listened and your response has been really amazing and it's humbling. So thank you. Look for good things to come in the new year. I've already asked for some interviews from some people that, um, who said, yeah, you know, uh, let's, let's look at, you know, later in the spring or maybe in the summer of some people that I never thought I would be able to interview. I'm so excited to be able to share that with you. So look for that in the new year and also some new changes to my blog. I'm going to look in at um, getting a new theme and kind of switching some things up there. It should be a little more uh, user friendly and stuff like that. Uh, So, yeah, look for that. Uh, I think you'll like it. Remember, you can find me on Twitter at Beard on a Bike. That's my Twitter handle. All right. Thanks, guys. Friends, I will see you in the new year.